Signorina Lombardi, è Formula 1, è una cosa per la ragazza. Visto che corro, giudicate voi. E la signorina Lombardi in questo sport solamente come una bella bambola? No, no, io no. <ride> Se volete giudicarmi voi, ma io ci tengo a essere un pilota e non affatto una bambola. As with many other competitive sports, and with many areas of society in general, Formula One is and always has been male-dominated. The kind of patriarchal attitudes and ideals that prevented many women from racing in the past may not exist today in the same way, but there is still a glaring lack of girls starting casting as children and teenagers, and even fewer that make it to the big leagues. Of the approximately 760 drivers to have entered a Formula One Grand Prix over the past 72 years, just five of them have been women. The casual F1 fan could be forgiven for thinking that no women have ever made the cut, but these five women, plus the many others that have been test drivers, team bosses, engineers, pundits, journalists and commentators have all been pioneers in their own right and have all broken barriers for women in motorsport. This is their story. Maria Teresa de Filippis was born in Naples on November 11th, 1926. She was the youngest of five siblings and was born into nobility, as her father was a count who owned palaces in Naples and Caserta. She enjoyed a privileged upbringing, indulging in skiing, horse riding and tennis as a teenager. She also learnt to drive, and in 1948, after two of her elder brothers, both amateur racing drivers, taunted her for her perceived lack of driving skills, she decided to enter a local hill climb event running for 10 kilometers between Salerno and Cava de Tireni in a Fiat 500 Topolino and probably won the event. She then began entering more hill climbs and endurance events, running in cars built by small local sports car manufacturers such as Tarashi Orania and Oscar, enjoying lots of success and winning events such as the 12 Hours of Pescara and eventually caught the attention of Maserati. She became a Maserati works driver in 1955 and that year finished second in the Italian Sports Car Championship 2000cc class. In 1956, she drove in a sports car race supporting the non-championship Naples Grand Prix, and after starting at the back, climbed all the way up to second place. She continued racing in sports cars, and in 1958 was invited by Maserati to compete in Formula One. Maserati had already withdrawn from Formula One by this point, after Juan Manuel Fangio won his fifth driver's title in the Maserati 250F in 1957, but many people still race their cars as privateers. She first entered the non-championship Syracuse Grand Prix in Sicily, representing herself, but was driving a championship winning car, and had also developed a friendship with Fangio himself, who said to her, you drive too fast, you take too many risks. She impressed by qualifying 8th out of 12 entrants and finished in 5th, four laps behind race winner and former fiancé Luigi Musso, but two laps ahead of Ken Kavanagh in 6th. A month later, she entered the Monaco Grand Prix. She was one of 31 drivers trying to qualify for a spot on a 16-car grid. She struggled with the physical stresses of the narrow Monaco streets and set the 22nd fastest time, being 5.8 seconds away from Joe Bonnier in 16th and 11 seconds away from Paul to Tony Brooks. Four weeks later, she made a second attempt with the Belgian Grand Prix at Spa-Francorchamps, a very different beast from Monaco. With only 20 entrants, all drivers qualified for the race. De Filippis went 19th fastest in qualifying, beating fellow Maserati driver Ken Kavanagh by 14.3 seconds, but was 33.9 seconds off pulses and Mike Hawthorne on the 14km circuit. Kavanagh ended up not starting the race, meaning she started last. She had briefly got herself ahead of Olivier Gendebian in the early stages, and survived retirements from several other drivers to finish in 10th place, two laps behind race winner Tony Brooks. Three weeks later, she attempted to enter the French Grand Prix at Rheims. However, the race director barred her from doing so, reportedly saying, the only helmet a woman should wear is the one at the hairdressers. A month later, she was permitted to enter the Portuguese Grand Prix at Boa Vista in Porto, this time driving on behalf of privateer team Scuderia Centro Sud. She was one of 15 entrants and struggled as she qualified 15th, 15.3 seconds behind Joe Bonnier in 14th and 27.7 seconds behind Pulse to Sterling Moss. She managed to pass Cliff Allison at the start, but the engine died on lap 7. Two weeks later, she entered her home race at Monza, representing herself once again. 
She qualified 21st out of 21 entrants, but was only 1.3 seconds off Giulio Cabianca in 20th, and 15.4 seconds off Paul Sitter Moss. She drove well in the race, as she managed to get ahead of Roy Salvadori, Graham Hill and then Cliff Allison, and was running in 5th when the engine died once again on lap 58, only 5 laps away from being classified. In 1959, she entered the BRDC International Trophy at Silverstone and qualified 23rd out of 24 entrants and retired on lap 41 with a gearbox failure. A week later, she entered the Monaco Grand Prix again. She had decided to partner up with fellow driver Jean Beira, who had commissioned Porsche to build a Formula 2 car based on the 718 RSK, which De Filippis would race with as Beira Porsche. She qualified 21st out of 24 entrants, 3 seconds off Bruce Halford in 16th, and therefore did not start the race. A couple of months later, Beira, who was contracted to Ferrari as a driver, was fired by them after punching team manager Ramona Tavoni in the face after a disagreement at the French Grand Prix. So then he decided to enter the Beira Porsche at the German Grand Prix at Avis in De Philippe's place. However, he was killed in a crash on the third lap of a sports car race preceding the Grand Prix itself. De Filippis then made the decision to retire from racing, having already endured the deaths of former fiancé Luigi Musso and close friends Peter Collins and Alfonso de Portago. A few months later, she met Austrian textile chemist Theodor Huschek, and they married and had a daughter and she disappeared from public life. She re-emerged in 1978 when she joined the international club of former F1 Grand Prix drivers. She served as the club's secretary for many years and became vice president in 1997. In 2004, she became a founding member of the Maserati Club, and on her 85th birthday in 2011 was made honorary president of the International Club of Former F1 Grand Prix Drivers. She was regularly invited to races, but rarely attended, not enjoying the way the sport had changed since she had raced, and she died in Scanzolo Sciati in Italy on January 8, 2016, aged 89. Maria Grazia Lombardi was born in Flugarolo in Italy on March 26, 1941. Her father was a butcher, and as a teenager she drove the company's delivery van, and it was at this time that she also realised she was a lesbian. She began doing a small amount of karting, and in 1965 purchased her first car and raced in Formula Monza. She made her single-seater debut three years later in Italian Formula 3, and finished runner-up to Franco Bernabai. In 1970, she entered the Formula 850 series with Baraghi and won four races and the title. She also drove for Alfa Romeo in the Italian Touring Car Championship. In 1971, she won the Formula Ford Mexico Championship and then spent two years in Italian Formula 3, finishing 10th both times. In 1974, she raced in the European F5000 Championship with Shell Sport Luxembourg, driving a Lola T330 and scored points in all but two races and finished 5th in the standings. That year, she also made her Formula 1 debut by entering the non-championship Race of Champions at Brands Hatch, which saw a mixture of Formula 1 and F5000 cars, and qualified 29th out of 32 entrants and finished the race but was unclassified. Three weeks later, she entered the BRDC International Trophy at Silverstone and qualified 23rd out of 26 entrants and finished 13th. Two and a half months later, she made her official Formula 1 debut, entering the British Grand Prix driving a Babin BC42 she had rented of Bernie Eccleston as a private entry for £5,000, being supported by both the Allied Polymer Group and the Italian Automobile Club, becoming the first woman to enter a Formula 1 Grand Prix in 15 years. There were 35 entrants, but only 25 spots on the starting grid. Lombardi qualified 29th, missing out on 25th by less than a second and being less than 4 seconds off pole sitting Niki Lauda, but had not qualified for the race. In 1975, she got a full-time seat driving for March, being supported by Count Gugi Zanon and the Lavazza Coffee Company and driving alongside Vittoria Brambilla. She managed to qualify for the South African Grand Prix by just 5 hundredths of a second, beating both Wilson Fittipaldi and Graham Hill, but was 2.6 seconds behind Brambilla in 7th. She therefore became the first woman to start a Grand Prix in 17 years. She got ahead of Guy Tunmer at the start and later Jacques Lafitte, but retired on lap 24 when the fuel line broke. She entered the Race of Champions again at Brands Hatch, this time as a Formula 1 entrant and qualified 11th but retired on lap 21 with handling problems. A month later, she entered the BRDC International Trophy for the second time, qualifying 12th and finishing 12th. The next Grand Prix was at Montjuic in Spain. 
Several drivers boycotted the race due to the state of the barriers and the guardrails when they arrived, though in the end defending champion Emerson Fittipaldi was the only one to withdraw. Lombardi qualified 24th, 6 seconds behind Brambilla in 5th, and got herself up to 19th on the first lap. Almost half the grid was out by lap 10, and on lap 26 Rolf Stommelen crashed and flew over the barriers, killing a marshal, a spectator and two photographers. Four laps later, the race was red flagged, by which point Lombardi was up to 6th. As barely 30% of the planned race distance had elapsed, half points were awarded and Lombardi famously scored half a point. She qualified 25th at Monaco after crashing, 4.8 seconds behind Brambilla in 5th, but as there were only 18 spots on the grid, she couldn't start the race. At Zolder, she qualified 23rd, 4 seconds behind Brambilla in 3rd, and then retired on lap 19 with an engine failure. She qualified 24th at the Swedish Grand Prix, 4 seconds behind Brambilla who was on pole, and then retired on lap 11 when the fuel system broke. A week later, she made her debut at the 24 Hours of Le Mans, driving a Renault Alpine A44C for Elf Switzerland alongside Marie-Claude Chamasson in the Group 5 S2000 class, but lost the fuel pump 8 hours in after completing only 20 laps. She qualified 23rd again at the Dutch Grand Prix, 2.9 seconds behind Brambilla in 11th, and went on to finish in 15th and last, 5 laps down on race winner James Hunt. At the French Grand Prix, she qualified 26th and last, 4.5 seconds behind Brambilla in 8th, and ran in last for the entire race and finished in 18th, 2 laps behind Bob Evans in 17th, and 4 laps behind race winner Nicky Lauda. She performed better at Silverstone, qualifying 22nd out of 28 entrants, 2 seconds behind Brambilla in 5th, and 1 second behind new teammate Hansi Oakham Stuck in 14th, but dropped down to last on the first lap and retired on lap 19 with an engine failure. At the Nürburgring, Lombardi qualified 25th out of 26 entrants, beating Tony Trimmer by 6.7 seconds, who failed to qualify, but was 16 seconds off Heis van Lennep in 24th, 30.4 seconds off Brambilla in 11th, 34.3 seconds off Stuck in 7th, and 37.8 seconds off Polsit in Niki Lauda. She managed to pass a couple of drivers at the start and finished in 7th despite struggling with the slow puncture, more than 2 minutes behind Lennep in 6th, and 10 seconds ahead of Harald Ertel in 8th. At the Austrian Grand Prix, she qualified a relatively strong 22nd out of 30 entrants, 2.6 seconds off Brambilla in 8th, 3 seconds off Stuck in 4th, and 3.5 and seconds off Pulses Alauda. The race ended early due to torrential rain, and she was the last of the classified finishers in 17th, 3 laps behind Brambilla who won the race. At her home race, she qualified 24th out of 28 entrants, 1.7 seconds off Stuck in 16th, 3.2 seconds off Brambilla in 9th, and 4.8 seconds off Pulsitzer Lauda. She climbed through the field and got herself up to 9th before crashing out on lap 22. At the season-ending United States Grand Prix, she made a one-off appearance for Frank Williams Racing Cars. She qualified 24th and last, 3.7 seconds off teammate Jacques Lafitte and 7.7 seconds off Paul Sitter Lauda, and ended up not starting the race after the car's ignition failed. Lafitte also didn't start the race after pouring visor cleaning fluid in his eyes after mistaking it for eye drops, and Lombardi tried to use his car but couldn't fit. Her half point at Spain meant she was classified 21st in the Drivers' Championship. March decided to retain her again for 1976. At the season opening Brazilian Grand Prix, she qualified 24th and last, 5.6 seconds off Stuck in 14th, 7.3 seconds off Brambilla in 7th, and 8.5 seconds off Pulse to James Hunt. She ran in last the entire race and finished 14th, 4 laps behind winner Nicky Lauda. After this, she was replaced with Ronnie Peterson, who had just left Lotus. The glaring gap in pace between Lombardi and her teammates, particularly in qualifying, had not gone unnoticed. She had complained of handling problems all season, and when the car was eventually stripped down it was discovered that the cast aluminium rear bulkhead had been cracked since her crash in Monaco. The issue was immediately noticed by Peterson and it was promptly fixed. In April, she did two races in the Shell Sport International Series, driving a Shadow DN1 for Team PR Riley, being unclassified at Alton Park and finishing ninth at Brands Hatch. Two months later, she made a second attempt at the 24 Hours of Le Mans, driving a Lancia Stratos for Team Aceptagil alongside Christine Dacremont in the GTP class, and they finished second in class out of four entrants and three finishers, but were 40 laps behind the winning team. The following month, she returned to Formula 1, driving a customer Brabham BT44B with Ram Racing. She qualified 30th and last at Brands Hatch, 4.6 seconds off teammate Bob Evans in 22nd, and 7.8 seconds off Pulsed in Niki Lauda and did not start the race. 
At the Nürburgring, she qualified 27th out of 28 entrants for a 26 car grid, 13 seconds ahead of Henri Pescarolo, but was 2.6 seconds off Alessandro Pesenti Rossi in 26th, 29.5 seconds off new teammate Rolf Schommelin in 15th, and 44.6 seconds off Paul Sitter Hunt. After qualifying, both BT44Bs were impounded by police due to legal action from former Brabham driver Loris Kessel. Stroll managed to jump into a works Brabham, but Lombardi couldn't find a drive. At the Austrian Grand Prix, she qualified 24th out of 25 entrants, beating the returning Loris Kessel by almost 14 seconds, and was 7 seconds off pole sitter James Hunt. She ran ahead of Kessel for most of the race, and was last of the classified finishers in 12th, four laps behind winner John Watson. Ram Racing withdrew from the remaining races and she was left without a drive and ended her Formula 1 career with 12 starts, 7 finishes and half a point. She made her third attempt at Le Mans in 1977, driving an Inaltera LM alongside Christine Beckers in the Group 6 S2000 category and they finished 4th in class. A month later, she and Beckers were invited to race for Chevrolet at the Firecracker 400 at Daytona, which along with Janet Guthrie made it the first NASCAR event to feature three female drivers since 1949. Guthrie and Beckers both had engine failures early on and Lombardi then retired on the 104th lap but was classified 31st. She then began regularly appearing in sports cars, mostly with Azella, and won the 6 Hours of Producer and the 6 Hours of Valeluna in 1979. She did one race in the short-lived British Formula 1 Championship in 1979, driving a Williams FW06 for Team Agostini at Mallory Park and finished 14th. She made a final attempt at Le Mans in 1980, driving an Ozella PA8 for her own team, Scuderia Torino Corse, alongside UK Prime Minister Margaret Thatcher's son Mark in the Group 6 S2000 category, but she crashed out after 158 laps. She then won the Mugello 6 hours in 1981. She joined the European Touring Car Championship with Alfa Romeo in 1982 and did two rounds in DTM in 1984. She was diagnosed with breast cancer in 1985 and retired from racing in 1988. The following year she formed her own touring car team, Lella Lombardi Motorsport, and then died on March 3rd, 1992, aged 50. Davina Mary Galitza was born in Bushy Heath in Hertfordshire in the United Kingdom on August 13, 1944, as the third of six children to a Polish father and an English mother. She was a natural athlete and discovered skiing at a family holiday to Switzerland aged four. Aged 13, she moved to Switzerland to train, and at age 19 she represented Team GB at the 1964 Winter Olympics, competing in downhill skiing and the slalom. She then also competed at the Winter Olympics in Grenoble in 1968 and Sapporo in 1972, and both times captained the British Women's Olympic ski team, but got no medals. Outside of this, she did achieve third place at the Badgerstein and Chamonix downhill skiing rounds of the 1968 Skiing World Cup. After Sapporo, she was awarded an MBE and retired from competitive skiing and opened a ski wear shop in London. In 1974, she was invited to compete in a celebrity Ford Escort race at Alton Park and surprised many by finishing second. She was then persuaded by Brands Hatch boss John Webb to pursue a career in motorsport. She did a small amount of karting and then quickly moved up to Formula Renault and Formula Vauxhall. In 1976, she got a full-time seat in the Shell Sport International Series, driving a 30s TS16 in the Formula 1 category, being supported and mentored by both John Webb and Nick Whiting. She didn't get any wins or podiums, but scored points at nearly every race and finished fourth in the standings. That year, she also made her Formula 1 debut by entering the British Grand Prix, a race also entered by Lena Lombardi, making it the first and so far only Grand Prix to have two women taking part. She managed to outqualify the far more experienced Lombardi by nearly two seconds, but was 28th fastest on a 26-car grid, and so did not qualify for the race. She did a second year in the Shell Sport International Series in 1977, now driving a second-hand 30s TS19. Her small team had extremely limited funds of just £10,000 and extremely limited technical knowledge, meaning the car was poorly set up and often broke down. She did one race in a March 742 and had a run of five consecutive retirements, but secured sponsorship from Olympus Cameras midway through the season and achieved four podium finishes and finished sixth in the standings. Tony Trimmer, who was also driving the TS19 but had a larger, more experienced team, dominated and won the title. She also entered the Race of Champions at Brands Hatch and qualified 15th and finished 12th. 
At the end of the year, she entered the final round of European Formula 2 at Donington, driving for Ardmore Racing and finished 15th. Hesketh driver Rupert Keegan did a couple of shell sport races against Galitza in 1977 and offered Galitza his Hesketh seat in 1978. She took Olympus Camera's sponsorship with her and as the team's sole entry qualified 27th and last for a 24-car grid at the season opening Argentine Grand Prix, 3.5 seconds off Eddie Cheever in 26th and 4.4 seconds off Brett Lugger in 24th. She tried again at the Brazilian Grand Prix and qualified 28th and last for a 24-car grid, 2.1 seconds off Vittorio Brambilla in 27th and 2.6 seconds off Rupert Keegan in 24th. After this, she was replaced with Eddie Cheever, but was invited to race for them at the BRDC International Trophy and initially failed to qualify after going 17th fastest, more than 5 seconds off teammate Derek Daly in 9th, but was permitted to start as first reserve after Nicky Lauda and René Arnoux withdrew, but crashed out. After this, she returned to the Shell Sport International Series, which had now become the British Formula 1 Championship. She raced in her 30s TS19 again at Zandvoort and finished second, and then decided to retire the outdated car. She acquired a McLaren M23 to race at Thruxton with Melchester Racing and finished seventh. She then entered the final round of European Formula 2 at Hockenheim in a March 782 with Bob Salisbury Racing but failed to qualify. From 1979, she started running alone as a privateer, she acquired a March 792 and entered the Brands Hatch round of the British Formula 1 but did not finish, and then entered the Donington round and finished 7th. She also entered three rounds of European Formula 2 but finished outside the points each time. She entered two rounds in 1980 and retired from both, and then entered the final two rounds of British Formula 1, finishing 6th at Alton Park and 9th at Silverstone. After this, she moved to the United States and began racing in sports cars and truck racing, and made sporadic appearances in the World Endurance Championship. In 1992, she came out of retirement as a skier and did a demonstration run at the Winter Olympics in Albertville and set a new women's downhill skiing speed record of 125 miles per hour. In 1994, she became a racing instructor with Skip Barber Racing Schools and then eventually became senior vice president of Skip Barber Racing. In 2005, she left the team to become a director of iRacing.com and in 2018 became a driving instructor for Bertel Roos Racing School. She's now 77 years old and no longer races, but makes occasional appearances at historic track day events and meetups. Desiree Randall Wilson was born in Brakpan in South Africa on November 26, 1953. Her father Charlie was a national motorbike champion, and she soon followed in his footsteps and began racing in micro midgets on dirt ovals at age 5. She was competing almost entirely against boys older than her, and in 1966, age 12, was runner-up in the South African Micro Midget Championship. As a teenager, she also dabbled in equestrian sports and athletics, but her real passion was motor racing. She tested a Formula V single-seater at Kyalami in 1972, and finished fourth in her first season and runner-up in her second. She then moved on to South African Formula Ford, where she met her future husband Alan Wilson and won back-to-back -back titles in 1975 and 1976, and with that the Drivers' Europe scholarship. Living in the Netherlands, she competed in the Dutch, Benelux and British Formula Ford 2000 championships and finished third in each, and was awarded the Springbok Colours Award. Money, however, was extremely tight, and she and her husband moved back to South Africa in 1978. She did two races in Formula Atlantic and then moved back to Europe, now living in the UK. Brands Hatch owner John Webb invited her to race at a Formula Escort women's race, which she promptly won. He then offered her and her husband jobs at the circuit and helped to enter her in the British Formula 1 Championship. He entered her for the Brands Hatch round and gave her a test, but she quickly discovered this was a publicity stunt and he then withdrew her entry. She had, however, impressed the Mario Deliotti team who offered her a drive in a three-year-old Ensign N175. She entered the final five rounds, retiring at Alton Park, finishing sixth at Mallory Park, fourth at Brands Hatch, third at Thruxton and sixth at Snetterton and finished tenth in the standings. When the season was over, she travelled to the United States to make a one-off appearance in the USAC Mini Indy Series, finishing 26th at Phoenix, and she was named South African Sportswoman of the Year. In 1979, she got a full-time seat in the British Formula 1 Championship with Melchester Racing, driving a year-old Tyrrell 008. She was set to win the first round at Zolder, but span in the rain and dropped a third, but still got fastest lap. She finished third again at Alton Park, and third at Brands Hatch, which also doubled as the race of champions. 
She got another third place at Thruxton and finished seventh in the standings. She did a third campaign in British Formula 1 in 1980 and moved over to Theodore Racing, driving a four-year-old Wolf WR4. She retired from the opening round at Alton Park, but at the next round at Brands Hatch three days later she qualified second behind Emilio Di Velotta, driving a Williams FW07 and went on to win the race in a very convincing fashion by 15 seconds and set the fastest lap, becoming the first and so far only woman to win a Formula 1 event, and in her honour a grandstand at Brands Hatch was named after her. She then finished 8th at Silverstone, retired at Mallory Park, finished 2nd at Thruxton and set the fastest lap, and then set out a one-off event at Monza. Ram Racing offered her a tyre test at Brands Hatch in De Velotta's Williams, a car with full ground effect, where she went 12th fastest out of 24 drivers, and she then made her official Formula 1 debut for them at the British Grand Prix at Brands Hatch. However, she was given a different chassis to the one she had tested with, one which had been crashed heavily at the Monza British Formula 1 round. The chassis was flexing, which negated most of the ground effects, and she set the slowest time, 5.3 seconds off Pulsar to Didier Pironi, while also having to battle with the chauvinistic Jacques Lafitte trying to force her off the track and failed to qualify. She returned to British Formula 1, now driving a Wolf WR3 and finished third at Mallory Park. She then left Theodore Racing and made a one-off appearance of Colin Bennett Racing, driving a Lotus 78 at Brands Hatch but retired, eventually finishing sixth in the standings. That year, she also started racing for Alain de Cadenet in the World Sports Car Championship, finishing third in class at the Brands Hatch 1000km and winning the Monza 1000km and the 6 hours of Silverstone. She also attempted to enter the 24 hours of Le Mans but crashed heavily on her qualifying run and was not permitted to race, even though her teammates de Cadenet and Francois Migol were. She also made her Asian debut, finishing sixth in the Macau Grand Prix and did eight races in the International New Zealand Formula Pacific Series. At the time, racing anywhere outside of the UK was exceptionally difficult for her as a South African national, as in 1977 the Commonwealth signed the Glen Eagles Agreement, which formally condemned apartheid and all but barred South African athletes from competing on the world stage. The only loophole Wilson could use was to race under a British licence, but she still received abuse wherever she travelled, despite not supporting apartheid herself. After a frenetic 1980, she struggled to find a drive in 1981, she was given a second chance at Formula 1 by Ken Tyrrell, driving for him at Kyle Army. Due to the FISA Foco War, it was not an official World Championship event as was planned and was made a Formula Libre event. She qualified 16th, beating Derek Daly, Jeff Lees and Eliseo Salazar, but stalled at the start in the rain and dropped down to last. She climbed through the field, including passing teammate Eddie Cheever, but spun off on lap 52 while allowing race leader Nelson Piquet through. She was offered further drives but found it near impossible to find any sponsorship. She did one race for Goodwin Racing in the MFD British Formula Atlantic Championship and joined the T-Bird Swap Shop team in the WSSC, driving a Porsche 935 where she finished 8th at the Brands Hatch 1000km and retired from the Kyle Army 9 hours. In 1982, she finished 4th at the Brands Hatch 1000km, driving the Ford C100 and made a second attempt at Le Mans. This time she was driving alongside Alain de Cadenet again and also former rival Emilio de Velotta for grid racing in the Group C category but retired after just 7 laps. She drove for T-Bird Swap Shop again in the Porsche 935 at the Daytona 24 hours alongside Preston Hen and Marty Hinzer but retired after 229 laps. She was then invited by North American Racing Team to form an all-female lineup for the 12 hours of Sebring alongside Janet Guthrie and Bonnie Hen, driving a Ferrari 512BB in the GTP class, but retired from this as well. That year, she was also invited to the Brickyard. She tested an Eagle 81 with Theodore Racing and became only the second woman to enter the Indy 500. She did her qualifying run first, which was a slow lap, but then teammate Gordon Smiley was killed in an accident on his and the team withdrew from the event. In 1983, she and Alan permanently relocated to the US. She got a full-time seat in IndyCar, driving for Wissard Motor Company, and started her campaign with another fail to attempt to qualify at Indy, but finished every other race with the best result of 10th at Cleveland. Alongside this, she drove for Moretti Momo in IMSA, and at Brainerd she was running in second and suffered a suspension failure which sent the car flying through the air and broke her leg, but three weeks later was on the starting grid for the Road America IndyCar round. She returned to France once again for Le Mans, driving a Porsche 956 for Obermeyer Racing alongside Axel Plangenhorg and Jürgen Lessig, and was running as high as third before various problems dropped into seventh. In 1984, she made only two IndyCar outings, failing to qualify at Long Beach and the Indy 500. 
She then finished fourth at the Brands Hatch 1000 km, driving a Porsche 956 for Kramer Racing alongside David Sutherland and Georges Fouché. After this, she began stepping back from racing. She did three races for IndyCar and one in Indy Lights in 1986, and in 1987 won the CS Point 6 hours and the Mossport 24 hours. In 1989, she did one round in British Formula 3000 at Brands Hatch and drove a Porsche 962 for Team Davey in the World Endurance Championship, finishing 14th at Brands Hatch and 13th at Fuji. In 1991, she made one final attempt at Le Mans as part of an all-female team driving a Spice SE 90C with Lynn St. James and Cathy Muller. They destroyed one chassis in practice and were given a far worse one for qualifying, but another team running the same car who'd failed to qualify broke into their garage overnight and fixed it up, and they started from last and retired with a rear suspension failure after 47 laps. There was also one Indy Lights race that year, an Exxon Supreme GT Series race in 1997, a few races in the North American Touring Car Championship in 1997, and she then eventually ended her career driving a BMW Z3 and a Speed Vision World Challenge race in 1999. After she and her husband moved to Salt Lake City, she briefly came out of retirement to race in the National Pirelli Porsche GT3 Cup Series, got numerous wins and finished second in her last ever race, finally retiring aged 63 in 2017. Wilson is still active in the motorsport world, supporting her husband who has designed numerous circuits and organised countless race events, and occasionally makes appearances in heritage and revival events, and also presented the trophies at the podium ceremony of the inaugural W Series race at Hockenheim in 2019. Giovanna Amati was born in Rome on July 20th, 1959. Her family was exceptionally wealthy as her father was a film producer and owned a chain of cinemas and her mother was a retired actress. As a teenager, she developed an interest in motor racing and purchased a 500cc Honda motorbike in 1974 which she raced in the streets and kept secret from her parents for two years. In February 1978, she was kidnapped by a group of gangsters led by Jean Daniel Nieto. She was initially kept in a house near to her own home, but after the police came looking for her, she was moved to a more remote location. She spent the next 75 days locked in a wooden cage, being physically abused and possibly raped. She was eventually released on an 800 million lira ransom, almost 1 million US dollars, which her parents acquired by selling jewellery and using box office receipts from Star Wars. Nieto was arrested after arranging to meet her on a date and the media claimed she'd suffered from Stockholm Syndrome, but he escaped from prison in 1989 and was recaptured in 2010. In 1981, Amati went to see her friend Elio De Angelis race at Vallelunia, and with his encouragement enrolled at the driving school there. She entered Formula Abarth and in 1982 got a pole position and a fastest lap. In 1984, she entered Italian Formula 3 and did a single race in European Formula 3. She did a full season of Italian F3 in 1985 and had a best result of fourth. She got similar results in 1986 and also did a single European F3 race at Monaco. In 1987, she moved up to International Formula 3000 and entered three rounds of BS Automotive. She finished 16th at Donington but failed to qualify at Perdusa and Imola. She moved to Colt Racing in 1988, finishing 10th at Jerez, retiring at Vallelunia, failing to qualify at Powellville and Silverstone, finishing 10th at Monza, 12th at Perdusa and failing to qualify at Brands Hatch in Birmingham. She raced in Japanese F3000 in 1989 but results were poor. She returned to International F3000 for 1990 with Roni Motorsport, retiring at Donington and failing to qualify at Silverstone, Powville, Jerez and Monza. Mid-season, she switched to Colin Bennett Racing, failed to qualify at Perdusa, finished 15th at Hockenheim and then failed to qualify at Brands Hatch, Birmingham and Le Mans. She started her fourth season in 1991, now with GJ Motorsports, which saw improvements. She failed to qualify at Vallelunia, failed to finish at Powville, failed to qualify at Jerez, then finished 14th at Mugello, retired at Producer, finished 9th at Hockenheim, 19th at Brands Hatch, failed to qualify at Spa, finished 7th at Le Mans and failed to finish at Armagnac. She also drove a Peugeot 309 in the Spa 24 hours alongside Didier de Rodriguez and Francois Turco but failed to finish. At the end of the year, she got her first taste of Formula 1, doing a short 30-lap test with Benetton, having allegedly had a brief romance with Flavio Briatore. Brabham had originally planned to sign Japanese driver Akihiko Nakaya to partner Eric van der Poel for 1992, but he was unable to acquire an FIA super licence as at the time Japanese F3000 was not recognised as a stepping stone to Formula 1, so they instead signed Amati. 
This caught her completely by surprise as she was expecting to move to America to race in Indy Lights, so she had to scramble for funds. Giulio Andreotti, a friend of her late father who had just been elected Italian Prime Minister, eventually gave her $3 million. Brabham had been in a gradual decline since last winning the title in 1983 and were using a year-old chassis with mediocre Judd engines. This, coupled with a complete lack of testing, meant that at the season opening South African Grand Prix, Amati spanned six times in practice and qualified 30th out of 30 entrants for a 26-car grid, 2.9 seconds of Stefano Modena in 29th, 3.9 seconds of Van der Poel in 26th, who'd barely qualified, and 8.9 seconds of Paul and Nigel Mansell. At the Mexican Grand Prix, she qualified 30th once again, 2.9 seconds behind Van der Poel in 29th, who joined her in not qualifying, making it the first race in Brabham's history where no drivers qualified, and was 8.7 seconds behind Paul and Mansell. There were 31 entrants into Lagos, which necessitated pre-qualifying, which Brabham were not required to do. Amati qualified 30th once again, going more than 3 seconds slower than the 4 drivers that advanced from pre-qualifying the previous day, but was still almost 12 seconds faster than the Andrea Moda of Roberto Moreno. Van der Poel also failed to qualify but was almost 5 seconds faster in 29th, and she was 11 seconds off pole sitter Mansell. After this, she was dropped and replaced with Damon Hill, who himself only qualified for 2 races before the team collapsed later in the year. In 1993, she entered sports cars and won the Women's European Porsche Super Cup Series. She then spent the next three years racing in the Ferrari Challenge. She also did two races in a Chevrolet Corvette in 1995 at the Paul Ricard 4 Hours and the Monza 4 Hours. She left the Ferrari Challenge in 1996 but returned two years later, but also did two races in the International Sports Racing Series and drove a BMW M3 in the Sebring 24 Hours and entered the Monza 1000km but was unable to start. In 1989, she raced once in the Women's Global GT Series and then did a campaign in the Sports Racing World Cup and finished third in the SR2 class. In 2000, she retired from racing and started doing media, punditry and commentary work in Italy. In 2014, she was invited to race at the Misano round of the Italian GT Championship for GDL Racing, driving a Mercedes-Benz SLS AMG in the GT3 class and finished 12th in the first race and 11th in the second. Giovanna Amati remains the last woman to enter a Formula 1 Grand Prix, but since then there have been women involved in testing and development roles. American IndyCar driver Sarah Fisher did a demonstration run with McLaren at Indianapolis after Friday practice at the United States Grand Prix in 2002. In 2005, British driver Catherine Legg drove in Minardi's very last test session before they became Toro Rosso in 2006. Spanish driver Maria de Velotta tested with Lotus Renault in 2011, and the following year signed as a test driver with Marussia. British DTM driver Susie Wolfe also signed as a test and development driver with Williams, becoming the first women to be contracted to a Formula 1 team in 20 years. De Velotta crashed helmet first into the loading bay of a lorry at the end of her first test and lost her right eye, and then died the following year. Wolfe made her Grand Prix weekend debut in FP1 at the British Grand Prix in 2014, but the engine died after only one lap. She drove again in FP1 at the German Grand Prix and drove in pre-season testing in 2015 and FP1 at the Spanish and British Grand Prix. At the end of the year, she announced she was retiring for Formula 1, being frustrated with the lack of opportunities she was given, and now runs the Venturi Racing Formula E team. In 2014, Swiss-Italian IndyCar driver Simona de Silvestro was made an affiliated driver with Sauber, with the intention of giving her a race seat in 2015. She did a few tests with them but was suspended in October due to contractual difficulties. The following year, Spanish GP3 series driver Carmen Yorda was made a development driver with Lotus. This appointment was met with widespread criticism due to her mediocre track record and it was believed she was hired more for her looks than her skill. She remained with the team when they became Renault in 2016 but only ever did simulator work. In 2017, Colombian GP3 series driver Tatiana Calderon became a development driver for Sauber, working in their simulator. She was promoted to test driver in 2018 and did a promotional test run in Mexico City and a two-day test at Fiorano. She remained a test driver when the team became Alfa Romeo in 2019 and did development work alongside reserve driver Robert Kubica before leaving the team in 2021. In 2019, former British GT champion Jamie Chadwick joined the Williams Driver Academy and became a development driver for the team, but is yet to drive a Formula 1 car. In recent years, there have been attempts to at least at face value give women opportunities in Formula 1, but still, they are few and far between. So why are there so few women in Formula 1? 
Back when the five aforementioned drivers were racing, Formula 1 was very much a boys club and women had virtually no presence in the paddock besides being grid girls. The five drivers all received varying degrees of discrimination and hate for entering a male-dominated space, but they all also received admiration and respect for their skill and determination. When the visor went down, they saw themselves as races first and women second. Lella Lombardi in particular did not understand the obsession the media had with her gender, as she saw herself as no different from the men and, like them, was just there to race. Maria Teresa de Filippis had the respect of her male counterparts, despite racing at a time when women were very much still expected to be housewives and mothers, but was still the only driver to be actively barred from racing because she was a woman. The sad truth is that those women who have raced or have been given opportunities to race have simply not been good enough for long-term success. Desiree Wilson was clearly the most talented driver of the five, talented enough to receive the ire of some of the men she was racing against. Bad luck, geopolitics and lack of financial support got in the way of what had the potential to be a prosperous Formula 1 career. Despite never starting a race, she won championships and races in a number of other categories she competed in, proving she got where she did on merit and not just because of money or publicity. With the succession of women who have had links to and opportunities in Formula 1 in the past decade, they have all had track records that have been far worse than their male counterparts, who have been given similar roles, and it can be argued they have been given unfair advantages and opportunities simply because they are women. The desire to see women in Formula 1 means that it generates a lot of interest when they are signed as drivers, but many women and girls have often struggled to get decent financial support, which is and always has been a must in Formula 1. This doesn't mean that women in general are not good drivers, but when the number of women and girls entering motorsport is already very small, finding ones that have the talent to be successful in Formula 1 is very difficult. Outside of the Formula 1 bubble, Michelle Mouton is a noted rally driver and was runner-up in the WRC in 1982, and Danica Patrick is a household name in the United States where she forged a long career in IndyCar and NASCAR. Various noted female drivers have given contrasting perspectives on women's ability to race against men. Maria Teresa de Filippis said that women can, but only in small numbers due to the physical challenge of it. Desiree Wilson took a more feminist stance by saying that women can, and if anything, are stronger than men due to the barriers and hurdles they have to overcome to do so. Giovanna Amati also thinks that women can race, but at the moment there aren't any that are ready or good enough. Carmen Yorda, however, thinks it's unfair to expect women to compete against men. In more recent years, there have been more active efforts to engage interest in motor racing from girls and women. The FIA has the Women in Motorsport Commission and the Girls on Track campaign, but the big one is the W Series. Since its inception in 2019, it has received a mixed reception. It has received praise from many for giving women the opportunity to race at an advanced and highly publicised level, and has given mainstream attention to previously largely unknown drivers like Jamie Chadwick and Bytska Visser, but as a counter to that has been criticised for excluding men, as motorsport at large has never actively barred women or being gender segregated. By being female only, there have also been concerns about how much help it is with competing against men. Sophia Flush has been especially critical of it, seeing it as a step back for women in motorsport. She has been able to become a full-time driver without its help, but has still only produced mediocre results. Both seasons so far have been won by Chadwick, who despite dominating the series, produced average results when she competed in Asian Formula 3 and the Formula Regional European Championship. And despite being a two-time champion and part of a Formula 1 team's driver academy, is now entering her third season in the series and has not been able to advance into Formula 2 or even Formula 3, even with the generous prize money for winning the series. Very few of the other women competing have won titles or even races in other series. Eight of the drivers from the inaugural season are still competing in it in 22, and to be blunt, are either too old or too slow to make it into Formula 1. There is one driver, however, who is turning heads. 16-year-old Juju Noda is making her debut in the W Series in 2022, and her father Hideki Noda is an ex-Formula 1 driver, so racing is in her blood. She had a stellar karting career and drove a single-seater for the first time aged 9. She spent two years in Danish Formula 4 and won races both times. Most critically, however, she is still a teenager and will be the youngest driver in the W Series this year, being almost half the age of the oldest, and has plenty of years ahead of her to grow and develop as a driver, as opposed to starting very late as Davina Galitza did, or moving up to Formula 1 before she was ready, as Giovanna Amati did. The absence of female drivers does not mean that women are absent from the Formula 1 world. 
There have been concerted attempts to make Formula One a more inclusive space for women, such as abolishing grid girls in 2018. Sauber and Williams have both had female team principals within the past decade, and when walking around the paddock you can find plenty of female engineers, mechanics, social media managers, journalists, pundits and commentators. Anyone who has been on Twitter will also know that Formula One has an increasingly large female fan base, despite not having any female role models on the grid. I, like many, would love to see a woman competing in Formula One, but one that is there on talent and not because of money or as a diversity hire. For the time being we will have to continue to wait, but with the increasing female interest in Formula One and the efforts to promote women in motorsports, I have no doubts that one day soon we will. That's all for this video, thanks for watching, don't forget to like, comment, share and subscribe, follow me on Twitter and Instagram at brook underscore F1, and I'll see you all next time.